dear colleagues, dear friends, thank you very much, Jeremy, and all my colleagues for this wonderful invitation, for this honor to speak to you about a very hot topic that is constantly changing, but yet remains a key issue in the management of patients with bladder cancer. As you know, early radical cystectomy has been one of the concepts that has been waxing and waning in importance, depending on our understanding of the biology of the cancer, and depending on the tools we have to manage the cancer without removing the bladder. A lot of novelties have happened, but yet we're not there yet. And today, however, we can develop new strategies, and I hope we can go through in the next 20 minutes what these strategies are to understand which patients benefit from an immediate or early radical cystectomy in high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. These are my disclosures and my conflicts of interest. In general, um, if you think about bladder cancer, high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer has a very specific treatment goals that differentiate it from all other diseases. One is to eradicate the existing bladder tumor. We want to prevent or delay disease recurrence. We want to prevent and delay, more importantly even, disease progression, which is a significant risk in these patients. And we want to prevent panureteal disease, thereby preserving survival. If you think about it, high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is often treated with BCG. It is a very effective therapy with its initial response rates up to 80%. However, not all the patients derive benefits. 20 to 30 percent do not benefit at all. And over time, many tumors relapse and become BCG unrefractory, unresponsive or refractory. And it's very important to understand that some of these high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer actually genetically and epigenetically cluster with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Their signatures in the expression of the proteins as well as the epigenetic makeup is very similar to T2 and higher disease. But how can we find out which these tumors are today? That's gonna be the art of medicine, which we'll go through over the next 15 to 20 minutes. T1 high grade disease is an aggressive disease. You know it, that famous tweet from Ashish Kamat, it's similar to clinical T3B, least than five plus five, 12 of 12 positive course, and PSA 75. That prostate cancer patient you would consider a killer cancer. T1 high grade has the same survival. It is a disease that has a high rate of disease progression up to 30% over the next 15 years, despite adequate BCG. It has lymph node metastasis in a significant number of these patients, and it's often understaged or, the, or under understage. Radical cystectomy for T1 has fantastic results. If you look at these results here, you have upward from 90% today results with an adequately T1 high-grade disease, upward of 90% disease-free recurrence at over 20 years. So let's compare what we would call conservative treatment, that is BCG in these patients, and versus radical cystectomy. If you look at T1 high-grade, which is a subgroup but it's the most significant or more aggressive subgroup of the uh, high-risk non-muscle invasive disease. There are currently no randomized trials in this field. So we have some comparative retrospective trials with a lot of shortness, uh, short-sightedness and limitations, but it's all we have. So what are the data? George Talman in 2004 showed there is no difference between BC, TRBT and BCG or immediate radical cystectomy if we look at it, at the data, there must have been a major selection of patients because the radical cystectomy patients did quite poorly. 30% of them died quite fast. And on top of it, from the TRBT with BCG, 30% required radical cystectomy later. So I don't think this data is fully representative, but what it shows us is that good selection can allow equal outcomes between the two strategies. There was a data from Densinger which actually favored immediate radical cystectomy. What they looked at immediate radical cystectomy for, um, for T1 high grade versus delayed radical cystectomy, yet not T2, but after BCG unresponsive. 
and they found better survival for those early radical cystectomy. But that cohort was enriched with negative predictive factors such as carcinoma situ, multiplicity, and large size. Here's another study from Guido Dalbagni from Memorial Sloan Kettering. They compared 84 immediate radical cystectomies versus 333 TRBT plus PCG. No difference in survival. But what they had done in that series is all the patients who had T1 on the re-TUR were actually considered for early radical cystectomy. So all it shows that data is that if you select the immediate radical cystectomy based on a proper criteria and select the right patients for TRBT and BCG with the right criteria, you may have equal outcomes. This is a study from uh, um, Houtman actually showing that delayed radical cystectomy after BCG does worse than immediate radical cystectomy. Already had looked at this, and this is a problem of understaging, and I think uh, um, it has also to do a little bit with the natural uh, disease process, missing the window of opportunity in some of these patients. This is the data from National Cancer Database, actually looking at the same question, early cystectomy plus lymphadenectomy, improves overall survival was the conclusion what I found out that the immediate radical cystectomy patients did better as to, compared to those that had local treatment and in, interestingly those patients with T1 non-muscle invasive bladder cancer that underwent radical cystectomy had even a benefit from, from, benefit from lymphadenectomy coming to the point that somewhere 10 to 15 percent of patients with clinical T1 bladder cancer actually have lymphatic spread already. What about if the disease progresses to muscle invasive disease? Then actually the patients first do worse than if they had muscle invasive and non-muscle invasive disease at the beginning. That makes sense. But they actually also do worse than the patients who had muscle invasive de novo. That means if you have a T1 or high-risk non-muscle invasive and you progress to muscle invasive, you actually have a worse prognosis than patients who present with muscle invasive disease. It's been shown over a multitude of studies. And it also is very interesting that the patients who progress to muscle invasive disease from high-risk non-muscle invasive disease and fail BCG actually, these patients are also less likely to respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. This has been shown by Pitsak, Eugene very beautifully. And this has to do probably with cisplatin sensitivity, that is with the ERCC2 mutations. So when I think about high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, I always think to myself, is radical cystectomy indicated and when? And I start the discussion with a patient early on, so their mind is framed for that radical cystectomy, should we need to trigger it? I always think, at a diagnosis, is immediate cystectomy triggered, yes or no? Is it when I get BCG, is it a still now indicated or should I continue with BCG? And then later, if they fail BCG, refractory, relapsing, or also called unresponsive, do I do salvage intravesical therapies or do they pembrolizumab approved by the FDA for that indication? Other drugs have been looked at in that gene, which is an intravesical gene therapeutic approach uh, with even you know, stimulating agents different gamma, is that an option or not? Anyway, if we trigger a cystectomy there, we have lost already some time and lost some of that window of opportunity. We looked at our retrospective data just briefly before. When a patient becomes muscle invasive, we certainly, if we trigger the cystectomy, then we certainly have lost approximately 15 to 20% of the patients. Um, and, and that is probably too late cystectomy. So immune radical cystectomy certainly in itself has a lot of good. It overcomes the problem of understaging. It has the best survival data. 90% of the patients will survive cancer-specific survival when done. Um, it is within the window of the opportunity, uh, of opportunity, which is very short. And today, we can perform the radical cystectomy very well with functional sparing in these patients with a high-risk non-muscle reactive. We can do nerve sparing, neobladder, and in young patients, there's great results and with the errors and so on. And we have recent quality of life data. It's been shown by the group of MD Anderson that shows that actually it's almost similar to the general population. However, the truth is still some of the patients, despite radical cystic, may die. It is certainly over-treated with a lot of the patients. 
it the surgery, the, no matter how well it's done, it's significant morbidity uh, and high grade morbidity in 20% of the patients. It's the elderly population, often smokers with multi uh, multiple comorbidities, and it has functional implication and cosmesis. And it's certainly it's not the patient choice. The own bladder is always the best bladder. So the question is, how to identify the best candidate for BCG or immediate radical cystectomy? One thing is certainly collect all the information you have. We have shown and others have shown that collecting the data during the TRBT and the clinical data to have all the data available for appropriate decision making is essential. So this is our checklist during the TRBT that we collected. The recent update of the of the ERTC tables with BCG treated patients shows that T1 high grade is a worse group with a 20% of progression. So this is from all the high risk non-muscular with the big players. We know that muscle in a specimen is a key factor. Um, then there's a very um, differentiated point of view on if you have a T1 high grade and you read TUR, if you have T1 high grade, the American point of view on this is then you, you certainly have a high risk of disease progression based on the Harry Hur data, 75% at five years disease progression. Uh, so T1 high grade on re tur should be considered for immediate radical cystectomy, as I showed you before in Guido Dal Wagner's paper. But the European view on this is a little bit differentiated. This is a multi-center data with Paolo Contero and Juan Palau looking at the patients and they said, no, the reality if you have T1 on re tur you probably have only 25% disease progression at five years. So it's not 75%, it's maybe worth it to try the BCG in this setting. So it's a, a point of uh, discussion. A lot of uh, retrospective data and, and meta-analysis were performed in this uh, setup, and actually factors that matter a lot are certainly concomitant CIS, but lymphovascular invasion, parent histology, and substage. There are other factors that may matter, but um, I think it's, it's, it's important to consider those. One that uh, certainly makes a lot of sense as well is the carcinoma inside in a prosthetic urethra because it's difficult to get a BCG there. Now you could resect it with a TUR, but um, that is certainly one additional factor. Lymphovascular invasion, which is present somewhere in five to 7% probably of the TUR specimens uh, adequately only in T1, um, is certainly for me a strong trigger to early radical cystectomy. And at some centers, even these patients are considered for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy, despite the fact that they're not T2 because the risk of lymph node metastasis is around 20 to 25%. We and others have looked at the data and we have confirmed the importance of LVI and variant histology. Now, I will talk about which variant histology we, we consider, but the variant histologies we're talking about is if you have urethral carcinoma with component of micropapillary, plasma cytoid, or sarcomatoid variants, then you should consider radical cystectomy early on and not proceed with BCG. This is sort of the understanding today that is a shifting uh, question. The other variants, you certainly could try TRBT. Now, there are some variants that we, uh, that are called variants, but they're not really variants. These are the pure squamous and the pure adenocarcinoma. Obviously, those are considered for radical cystectomy. And a small cell component is neoadjuvant epitopocyte cisplatin chemotherapy. But these are not, these are non urtl variants. On the urtl variants, micropapillary, plasma cytoid, sarcomatoid. These are the ones that change your disease strategy to not perform RTRBT or BCG, but should be considered for radical cystectomy. Now, there's still some debate there, but this is sort of my understanding on the on the issue as it stands today. Substage certainly will matter. If you can do it, I will do it. Uh, and the best strategy of substage is probably the one from Van Rin, looking at T1 extensive or microinvasive. If you can do it, it's reproducible. And, and, and I think that one would also give you some further detail. Let's not forget that it's very important also to our patients counsel them about smoking cessation because smoking increases your likelihood of not responding to BCG. This has been shown in our and other data. So for me, when I look at a patient, I think to myself, can this patient be safely treated with BCG? Yes, if 
No persistent T1 on restaging. Now, I said the U.S. stance is that one. The European stance is try it. I think it's not one factor, but it's certainly one of the factors for me to think about, really, do I want to give them BCG? No prostatic stromal invasion. You know this is a T4, so it actually should be, in a way, radical cystectomy or even neutral and chemotherapy. No lymphovascular invasion. For me, that is a hard factor. Is that bladder worth saving? You know, some of these patients have crippled bladders from, you know, a lot of previous BCG or other therapies or other issues. Macropoly sarcoma and plasmatoid satoid variant, I personally consider them candidates for radical cystectomy. Now, if it's less than 5%, I would argue about it. But, you know, it's, we don't really know what is the cutoff of percentage. Am I able to completely resect the tumor? That is also important. But uh, uh, sometimes it takes me two or three times, and it's a low-risk cancer. I don't mind taking two or three TRBTs. Is the patient going to be compliant with his BCG? And will we trigger radical cystectomy if BCG is unresponsive? That is also very important. We have to be ready to change strategy. You cannot marinate the patient BCG. So giving BCG is also about understanding when BCG unresponsive disease evolves and then triggering radical cystectomy at latest there. And stop smoking is certainly something as a good doctor we should counsel all our patients. For patients who are BCG unresponsive, radical cystectomy is certainly the strategy, the, the, the strategy of choice. There are a lot of other bladder sparing strategies that are evolving over the years. I think they will come and they will mature, but they're not yet there. So here's the EAU guidelines. Um, if you look at it, which patients do we consider the highest risk or very high risk? In these patients, we should consider radical cystectomy. It's those with T1 high grade with a lot of carcinoma in situ, in my opinion, large tubers that are unresectable, recurrent T1 high grades that have failed BCG. They have carcinoma in situ in the prostatic urethra, micropapillary plasma sarcomatoid, or LVI. These are the patients that should radical cystectomy the first option and only BCG in those who refuse it if the tumor can be completely resected as an alternative. And the second group is those who are BCG failures and their radical cystectomy is done. Where are we going to go into the future? The future certainly is going to be looking at some genetic and epigenetic classification of these tumors, understanding the inherent biological potential of the tumor to really create harm and to become panuretelial and um, for those patients, we need to trigger the radical cystectomy early on. You know that molecular profiling has been already published and shown to be successful in stratifying the patients. Today, we have five groups, and I think the more we know about it, the better we can also even design systemic therapies to help a personalized disease approach in those patients. FGFR targeting agents, which are in a second-line metastatic setting already approved, uh, approved in, by the FDA, in the U.S. could be considered in some of these patients early on. Uh, as you know, the mutation rate is quite high in early disease, and there's other strategies there. So in conclusion, I think today uh, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit more mature, and I've learned from many of my teachers that in prostate cancer, I'm becoming more and more conservative, but in high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, I'm becoming more and more aggressive. Good outcomes is a result of good surgery and staging, understanding disease, accurate risk assessment with the factors I told you about, and good decision making when, with the patient together, because they have to understand the risk benefits and alternatives in detail. The goal is to identify the appropriate patient for the current therapy that we have, that is BCG versus radical cystectomy, and to discuss the alternative strategies for those unlikely to respond. Those are the ones you would consider for radical cystectomy. I think the goal tomorrow will be to understand the cancer biology better in order to give the right therapy for the right cancer in the right patient at the right time. The promise of precision personalized medicine, hopefully one day we can fulfill that. Thank you very much for being with me and for spending your time listening to this topic. All the best and greetings from Austria.